It's Thursday, it's 12.15 and we're live in Westminster. Keir Starmer talks football with President Biden in the Oval Office. I tell you what, that, it's all because of the Prime Minister. <laughs> <laughs> I lost a game right to the Labour government. Is football coming home, Prime Minister? It looks like it. But it's the prison crisis back home that's on the Prime Minister's mind, telling reporters some of what we have found is shocking. The situation is worse than I thought it was. And this from the man who was Justice Secretary just a week ago. We have to work out as a nation how many people can we afford to lock up. Should this councillor, now an MP, be allowing council workers to do a four-day week? And water bills could rise by 21% by 2030. Should customers be paying to fix the sewage system? Joining us today, Labour MP Josh Simons, Conservative MP Kieran Mullen, Liberal Democrat MP Pippa Halings and non-affiliated peer Claire Fox. This is Politics Live. Welcome. You heard in the headlines that the average household water bill will increase by 21% in England and Wales by 2030. My opening question to the panel, starting with you, Josh, is should customers pay more to fix our water system? Well, I spoke to hundreds of my constituents in Makerfield during the campaign and they really felt that this issue exemplified a Conservative government at that point that had just stopped governing. And what you've seen almost immediately is a shadow, a, now a Secretary of State, Steve Reid, mm. who's written to Ofwat to set out some really practical measures mm. to address that problem. And in particular, he said, any price rises that uh, consumers have to pay, that money must be ring-fenced for infrastructure improvements. It cannot be spent going to shareholders yes. or to lining bosses' But what's pockets. the answer to my question? In the meantime, you're in government now. That was before uh, election day. Should customers pay more to fix the system? Well, I think that it's inevitable that there are some price rises, and that's what Off What have come out and said today. I think what matters is what the government are asking Off What to do when those, with the money that is raised from those price rises. And that's where you've seen Steve Reid come out today and be really clear sure. that money must be spent on things that in the long term will actually bring down those bills. And again, yeah. so that is what the government yeah, failed fine. to do. All right, you're going to make sure you hope um, that Off What will rein in, or ring fence, as you say, uh, that that money money raised will go will not go into bonuses well let's put it that way what about you uh, blamed for a broken system in terms of regulating uh, the water companies um, and perhaps letting them get away with it as many people think should customers pay more to fix well, it can I just start out by saying actually when we came into government that seven percent of the of the discharges were monitored so we've now that got, got that up to a hundred percent so they're actually in a position to put in place plans that the water companies are, are being held to and they, they're due to bring the the overflows down anyway and and the money that off what agrees with them is already based on the principle of what they're going to spend on on improvements so I don't really know what difference what steve said makes to it because that's the whole point of the process they already have in place with but you off agree what. then customers will have to pay i more. think in reality people think this is a really important thing for them then they're, then they're going to have to to put some resources towards it the one thing i would always point out when discussing this issue is there's a lot of talk particularly from labor about this being about privatization and, and profits i would ask everyone who's listening to look up welsh water Welsh Water deal with this issue in Wales and they're a not-for-profit and they're one of the worst performers. So there is not a simple narrative, whatever Labour might have wanted you to believe, around this issue. And I look forward to seeing you know, how much quicker is it that you're going to bring down the, the discharges well, than we've let already Let Josh planned. respond. Well, this is a typical answer from Kieran that we've heard from Conservatives for way too many years now. It's everybody's fault but ours, despite the fact we're in power. Look at Wales, look at the fact that we're already doing it. In the end, off what report to the UK government? And Steve Reid has used his powers today as the Secretary of State to set out a bunch of practical measures that will, in the long run, make a real difference to customers. So how much and I think actually than that what we were going to do. How much I quicker? Because that's what people actually customers want are to really know. How much hired quicker of, are you going to do it? Because if you don't answer that MPs, question, it doesn't mean anything. Well, let blaming respond. everybody except you won't that. the 14 years that they had in power. How much quicker are you going to do it than we were going to? That's the actual. That's all customers care about. How much quicker is it going to happen under us, than, under you, than it was under us? I actually don't agree that that's all customers care about. They don't I want to discharge to, hang on, hang on, quickly. Hang on, Shall I answer that point? You asked me a question, I can answer it. How much it. quicker? Uh, actually, the people I spoke to in my constituency of Makerfield, 
understand that change takes time and they want a government that is honest and open about that fact instead of a government that promises the world and delivers so you did nothing. Answer. All right, Pippa, what about you? Do you think customers should cough up uh, more money to fix the water system? Well, I think Lib Dems have been very clear. and We'd love Labour to steal some of, of our ideas. So people are really, really concerned about sewage mm. and about the water supply and the, you know, We've actually had on the campaign trail sure. in Guildford, in North Devon, yeah. um, in Thames Water as well, where people actually haven't even had access to clean water. Mm. But the issue here is that Ofwat doesn't have the teeth. <laughs> so we would actually say that Ofwat can't rein in, as you've said. They can't do what people are wanting them to do, which is to really make sure that they are not dumping raw sewage into our chalk streams and that, for example, in South Cambridgeshire, that they are providing the infrastructure to ensure we've got enough water supply for the homes mm. that we have to build. So what we have said is scrap Ofwat because it does not have the teeth to rein in. And we don't believe that customers... It, you know, we've had the water companies paying massive bonuses to bosses and now we're asking mm. customers Although to Although Labour's suggesting exactly the same thing. Yeah, we're, we're, we're in agreement. But what we're not saying, we don't think that customers should be picking up that bill right ah. now. We should get through to off what, change off what, so you've got somebody who can actually right. rein them in. And then we think, and we've said to Labour, mm. there is money to be able to make sure that we actually pay for that infrastructure with the water companies. Uh, uh, Claire, what do you make of it all? I mean, Kieran does make a valid point in terms of far more testing uh, these days in terms of the quality uh, of our water, and it's shown to be lacking clearly. Um, but what do you make of the idea of customers having to pay more to fix what many of them think is a completely broken system? Well, of course, what we need at the moment and actually I've been impressed with the Labour Party doing this, is a bit more command and control in order to get the infrastructure sorted. I mean, I don't know about sort of telling the companies they need to do it. I, mean, I feel like you should just do it. But we haven't built a new reservoir for 30 years. There's a lot that needs to be done. You can't have the housing programme that you're discussing in t in unless you sort out the drainage. This is absolutely urgent. I agree with that. And I, I suppose I don't sort of care who does it, but I don't think just kind of telling them what to do. I mean, I disagree with this sudden cancellation of, um, you know, drilling oil, for example. I, I, I wonder where you're going to get the energy to build the new houses from. But, it, but in some ways, something's happening, something's being done. I think it's actually fair enough, by the way, to mention Welsh water. I'm from Wales. I mean, it's a disgrace. So, in other words, I don't want to fetishise who owns the water companies. I do want to make a point that it's very important that customers are the lowest down the chain. And when you say pay, one of the worst things I heard this morning is there's a whole discussion going on that what we need to do is to flush less, use less water. You know, the owners... Are, and this is behaviour modification well, of the most ridiculous... We, we do, actually. So I've had plenty. So people do need to change behaviour. No, people they are, don't people are ready need for to it. change behaviour in the modern world. Actually, what we need to do is monitoring. So you were talking about monitoring the quality. Want... So the money has been slashed from the Environment Agency to be able to monitor. Yes. So in fact, they're told not to monitor. So what we need is better monitoring. We so Labour, we would actually need you to be... Modification make, make, well, why not? Why not? Why not? Why not, Claire? Because we live in a modern society and the austerity... It's wasteful, isn't Austerity it? takes a range of forms. A particular environmentalist version... I know that you're Lib Dem, but you're Green Lib Dem. A particular environmentalist version of this is to say to ordinary members of the public, you must change how you live and it will be less... Uh, it will be less in the modern era. If you want to find right. lack of water usage, go to any developing country where they haven't got any to use. We should not compromise on that, and the government should not be bossing people. Well, one of the uh, one of the top priorities, the most immediate uh, priorities for the new Labour government is prisons. Uh, the Prime Minister, as you heard again in the headlines, uh, Sir Keir Starmer speaking to reporters in America yesterday, just to remind you, and said some of what we found is shocking in prisons. The situation is worse than I thought it was. Was he preparing uh, the ground for this announcement expected tomorrow? Here, BBC News: prisoners to be released early to ease over crowding. Now, the main measure will be automatically releasing prisoners on what they call standard determinate sentences after they've served 40% of their sentence. It's been uh, confirmed by government sources. Currently, they're released after serving 50% of their sentence. There will be exemptions for sexual and serious violent offenders. Uh, Claire, did the Labour government have any choice? Well, 
this raises very big issues for us because one of the nerve-wracking things that the, the uh, Labour government are going to have to do now is deal with the fact that some people want to put forward a, you know, jails, prisons don't work anyway and people shouldn't be punished. And they have to be aware of the fact that that is not the way that we should approach criminal justice. The Labour Party now have an opportunity, by the way, to resolve another problem, which is IPP prisoners. And there's a big letter gone from the justice unions to the Labour Party. These are on a prison sentence that was abolished over yeah. a decade ago. I know this is, but this is, if you're going to release people, sure. there's 3,000 people who are in on an unfair and unjust system. But when you say they've got a choice, I was delighted to see James Timpson I don't, and he um, is the new uh, prisons, prisons minister that Keir Starmer has but brought in. But I think in. it just requires more than this. And we okay. have to bear in mind what happened with that terrible case in Bushy yesterday. Yeah. When you let people out and you say, oh, no, we'll only let out the really serious ones. Mm. Well, actually, you know, the well, domestic yes. abuse, fraudsters, mm. thieves, you don't want to think that they are not getting let, a just sentence. Sure. I, let, let, let's keep specific cases to uh, okay. one side. It is uh, dreadful, of course, uh, what's happened. Did the Labour government have any choice, or does it have any other choice than to release uh, some offenders after serving 40% of their tariff? So I think there's very little choice, given that we hear there's around sort of 600 places available nationally now, so we're in absolutely dreadful chaos from the Conservative government now. It is just disgraceful. What I'd like to highlight, though, is we've got to look, as well as that, we've got to look at support for victims at the minister. So they have to be top priority as well. But secondly, it's about the reoffending rates, and we really need to make sure that we've actually cut those down, slash reoffending rates, and that's by making sure that we invest again in those rehabilitation programmes. But I'd like to draw attention to another thing, and that is the 20% of the prison population that is on remand. So they are in yes. overcrowded pillars without any sentencing yet, not known whether they are guilty or not yet. And the number of suicides of people within that remand. So in 2021, 1,000 male suicides of people on remand. So we do need to deal with other issues around just the uh, earlier release. Well, are you happy with early release? Well, I think there does come a point when it comes to prison capacity where you don't have a choice sometimes. But what I will be looking at and what, as a backbencher, I was talking to the government about when they were discussing it was we need to make sure these things, measures are very time sensitive because in my experience, the kind of civil service and lobbying wing of this area Picking up what Claire said about they don't like the idea of, of punishment. They they get these measures in and want them in for the long term because they actually don't really believe in the importance of prison as a punishment. So if we're going to do it, let's do it in the most limited way we possibly can. A lot of this does backdate to the remand issue, which in itself mm. that back backdates to the court backlog issue because yeah. of COVID. So all of these people would not normally waiting for a sentencing as long as they, they have been. And so, again, there are no quick fixes on that in the long term because you can't suddenly double court capacity to, to get all this stuff done. And we're making progress, or were making progress, right. but it's not going to be overnight. Right, but it will be slow, any progress in terms of increasing capacity. I mean, in March, uh, Josh, when the government announced early release for some prisoners, the now Justice Secretary, Shabana Mahmood, said... Successive Conservative governments have failed to build enough prison places. This has led to them granting early release to violent criminals, domestic abusers and burglars. And that's just what you're going to do. Yeah, and there's a prison in my uh, constituency, a Makerfield, actually, where, you know, if, if the Labour government decides that we need to expand the size of that prison, then that's exactly what we should do. I mean, I think the, the admission today from the former Justice Secretary, Alex Chalk, was fairly extraordinary. Mm. He said, I, as the Justice Secretary, identified a concrete measure that would have eased the crisis months ago, and a Prime Minister who was too weak to actually do what had been recommended by his Justice Secretary because he was frightened of his Except, backbenches, well, right. chose Sorry. not to do well, it. And well, now we are days harsh. into a Labour government and we've done it. Well, so so your, is your commitment then as the Labour government is that you will always do whatever the executive wants and never listen to backbenchers? I mean, that's quite literally how democracy is supposed to work. Backbenchers well, can exert influence Just before, over just issues. since he's brought it up, let's have a listen to what Alex Chalk actually said, or part of it. Let's have a listen. It was difficult as we know, at the end of the last Parliament, to be satisfied that you're going to get things through Parliament, because at the risk of stating the bleed and obvious, you've got to win votes. The point is, whether it's STS 40 or the short sentences stuff I was talking about, you have to win 
votes. And that is the calculus that was um, was taxing uh, the Prime Minister and others. Well, Kieran, there it is. Yeah. He so, set it out. So, the... first of all, we passed record amounts of legislation in the last Parliament. So, of course, there will be bills, whatever your majority and whatever uh, government oh, come is on, Kieran. What he's saying is there no, was no, no political will no, no, to he, do it. Yes, because on that issue, that what is significant backbench opposition on that issue. And I, I was part of that concern because these things are important to us. As I said, you so see... So the Prime Minister put the party so, so before the country. That's no, what you're uh, saying. So, no, it's it's called it's called what that means just, is it's called the Prime Minister so was, was, could not control his party I, I, and so I, I mean, didn't do want, what's in the national I interest. Think it's very well, hang on. I don't want to get involved in either of you. Both parties played that game. Both parties. In the House of Lords, when we were on the Victims and Prisoners Bill, there was some appetite from lots of people on all parties to deal with, and I keep saying it, but the IPP sentences just as an example. It was absolutely clear that the Labour front bench were very nervous that they would be seen as mm, soft, soft on law and order. Shaban Mahmood, indeed, they were criticising the government for letting people out early. So I am calling for a non-sectarian, non-party-based take criminal justice seriously, don't do things for votes and don't do things for headlines. Right, but it's easy but, to say when you're up against an election, that's no, what people I know, do. But that, they did it, so it's just that one was accusing the other. I'm just pointing out you both right, did it. All right. Now we're in a situation, and I hope bravery well, and courage will characterise the new government God. when it comes to... A I, I, can we not take bravery and courage? Ha, 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 I just would like to say, so... Yes, let's have that. Let's have that cross party because it has to be, you know, taken really seriously. Yeah. I agree with you. But also, we, you, um, for the for the the new appointments that have been made. So Timmonson has said a third of the people in jail should not well, be. Well, here it so is. Let's, so let's, since so Pippa's mentioned it, the yeah. Daily Mail. This yes. is the bravery yeah. as you ha are discussing. Keir Starmer's new prisons minister, James Timpson, who's had a long uh, career in this field, believes only a third of inmates should actually be in jail. Do you welcome so that? I just want to pick up what Claire said. I have a sincerely held view about the importance of punishment for prisoners. It's not politics for me. It's, I actually believe that's one of the reasons I got into Parliament. I spent some time as a volunteer policeman. Victims, I don't think, don't always get the punishment from their perpetrators they deserve. It's not just politics. And what James has said, I absolutely recognise there is more that we can do with some of the prison population to divert them away from crime and reoffending. But I'm afraid when you look at the, the hard yeah. data, even the best possible programmes are not particularly good at diverting people away from crime. Best possible really? programmes are not in existence. What, what sort of evidence let's, are you Let's have a look here? at what the often common example is mm. drug rehabilitation. So if you go to the Priory and get the absolute best drug rehabilitation in the world that money can pay for, mm. your long-term abstinence is probably about 50%. And that's the best that money can do. The problem we've got at the moment is people so, locked up for so, 23 so, hours so, a day in their yeah, cells. Yeah, sure, right? I accept that. I accept that's that. That's quite common. I agree, Claire. There's more that we can do right now, and the prison overcrowding is making it difficult. But this is exactly what I'm warning against, that in the short term, because of short-term issues, you move away from what is still incredibly important to the public, that perpetrators of crime are punished. I, right, but should yeah. that number of people be in jail? Is, yeah. is this... No. But, but how do you decide? How do you decide who should go and who should Well, you've got to go? strengthen back again. Legal aid system, which has been stripped away from people who are disadvantaged and can't access the aid. Secondly is in the magistrates, which are completely overwhelmed as well because it's all been dubbed on magistrates. And as you said yourself, the, you know, the, the backlog that is there in the, in the court and the remand. Unless you have that, we've got a spiralling situation where people will go further and further and further into different types of crime and an inability to get themselves back on the right but there's path. But there's also a, a very serious problem with probation and what happens when you leave prison. Yeah. And, and what you've got at the moment is a situation in which there's no attempt at rehabilitation in prison, serious. I mean, you know, I agree there's a lot of you know, jokey schemes and all the rest of it. But but I've done lots of work in prisons over the years and we've got projects and all the rest of it. It's not that you say, do our debating matters beyond bars and then you'll never commit a crime again. But you can give people yes. something to think about other sure. than f having a fight over, you know, the fact that there's only one sausage on the plate, whatever yes. it is, right? Stupid example. But no, 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 it was. Yes, I'm we understand what you mean. The point I'm making is, is that there's more to this than headlines. And I do think you have to be careful about not ignoring the punishment bit. But I think that you need to be careful, we all need to be careful about no easy answers. Yeah. Yeah. I don't agree well, with Timson necessarily yeah. that a third shouldn't be in prison. Why? But well, we, I do. No, because I, I was going to say, I don't think there's a third necessary I see what you mean. who decides. Yeah. But I was interested in one proposal, which was that many women yes. who are in prison actually arguably shouldn't be in prison for the nature of the crimes that they're in for, could be punished in the community. All right, well, let's then show. Let's grab show. hold of those prisons yeah. and repurpose them 
more generally. Uh, let's show this uh, mirror headline and then I must get you to answer uh, the question that James uh, Timpson poses. Anyway, women's prisons could be shut and converted to house male inmates to ease that overcrowding. Should that be considered? Well, it is shocking if you look at the statistics across sex, the uh, number of women who are in prison for crimes that are, you know, much less violent and much less serious so, than, yes. than men. I, I think it's worth considering, worth given the nature of the yeah. crisis at the moment, of course it's worth considering. And know. what about James Timpson saying a third of inmates, all right, if not a third, a large, a significant number of people in prison shouldn't be there? Well, I mean, the first thing just to underscore is that I think it's fantastic he is doing that job, and I think that is really so you worth agree saying. With him. This government has already brought in people like him to help to solve these really difficult, you yeah. know, we've said no easy answers many times, and we haven't actually had a government that's accepted that as its starting point for quite a long time. And appointing him to do that is, 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 is exactly that. Right. I, I don't <laughs> think that you can take a certain figure, like 30%, no. apply it to the population and know Nobody's that that's saying. the right All right, number. but, but, but I, so, I'm so that's old not. enough uh, to remember the government of all the talents, the goats, as they called it, under oh, Gordon right. Brown, bringing people in for their expertise and then in many cases ignoring their advice. Is that what you're going to do with James Timpson? Well, remember that he's not an advisor or a sort of he's not on the board of the department. He's not a technocrat. No. He's, he's been made... The, the, he's the been government the all the time, they had ministers in um, the laws in the same way. Do you bring people in with expertise into ministerial positions only to ignore them? Well, let's see what happens. I mean, I'm not old enough to remember the government of all the talents. Um, uh, so uh, just to say that up front. But I'm excited by this because I think, you know, he has the experience of some, you know, some of these problems, as we've talked about today, are really granular and quite yeah. specific. And they, under, they, they require an understanding of the inside. Mm. He has that. Yeah. And I think it's a great credit to the government that they are bringing that kind of specific granular experience yeah. inside all right, but let's say it's the his politics recommendation. and not outside of let's it. Let's say he recommends that. Would you back it? Well, that's a, you know, hypothetically, he hasn't recommended it and well, it's now part well, of the he, government. Well, he is um, saying it there. I'm just asking you for your opinion. Would you back that in principle? Well, you asked me if I agree with that. And I said quite clearly that I don't think it's possible to right. put an arbitrary number on the percentage of prisons that should be in that. Who gets to decide that number? How does it get applied? That doesn't but seem we could to say, me what's the, direction the right we want way to, to do in? policy. Do we want to go into a, you know, into a direction yeah. where we're making sure that the, the wrong people won't be going into prison, that we've actually got measures for enabling well, them I, to... I have a the, huge only difficult, the only difficulty we've got at the moment, or, sorry, uh, one difficulty we've got at the moment is, and this isn't just public perception, it's real. For many ordinary members of the public at the moment, they have been told that if they have a, a, a burglary, if their car's taken, if there's, you know, even if attacks happen, there's no point phoning the police. They won't be looked after. So there's a broader problem of criminal justice. So the difficulty we've got is, whilst the focus is on should we not send people to prison, at the moment we're not actually prosecuting them for crimes. Right, and of course they're connected. And crimes right? are happening. And there's a sense in which, you know, we've all been... I, I mean, I, I can't get over the fact I can go into Tesco mm. and watch people stealing well, we've, things. Well, we've said... And everybody else is watching them and nothing happens. Mm. And then well, the idea that then they might get caught and then they kind of like, oh, well, it doesn't really matter. That mm -hmm. does not inspire confidence in society and it will lead to fracturing, it will lead to... So I, I, I agree. I, I'm liberal in many ways on, on, on prison, but more on reform. I think that Timpson's job, Lord Timpson, as he will be, Lord Timpson's job would be very important, for example, in encouraging other employers to employ former prisoners. But he himself mm. said, oh, I wouldn't take anyone under 25, so he's not that liberal. Do you know what I mean? I mean, he's like... But don't we think we well, should have me... more community policemen? So everybody that are on the campaign trail would like to see more visible community policemen on the streets, which is helping to avoid crime. It's a deterrent, and I think that's where we'd get the reassurance for communities. I mean, one of the reasons we have... Another one of the reasons why we have this increase in prison population is because there are more police officers that we've employed that are arresting more people. Oh. So that's Again, that's something... Although not true. for shoplifting. It's true. More laws. And, but I, could, I do absolutely agree... Uh, respect hugely uh, James Timpson and his family's work in this area for many, many years to rehabilitate people. But I'm afraid when you actually look at the data, there's this myth that we're casually locking away people who've maybe just shoplifted once or yeah. women who've committed a petty crime. I've been on the Justice Collect Committee in the previous parliament. When you look at it, the vast, vast, vast majority of people in prison are serial offenders or serious offenders, which when you actually come to look at the numbers to get people out, it's very difficult to do because they're all actually, have been most of them given some opportunities to not re-offend, I'm not saying just get one offer, but you know there comes a point where people just carry on offending and there's only so much you can do. Besides, actually, the biggest thing that stops it is they age out.
But that's the biggest factor for people not carrying on offending. They get in their 40s and they've just had enough of it all. So you just have to be realistic about what people are like. All right. Well, of course, this was a row going on, as we now hear, um, between Alex Chalk, who was the then Conservative uh, Justice Secretary, with Number 10. But it seems that some of the drama of Conservative uh, politics and politicians continues in opposition. Let's have a look at uh, this tweet from Steve Swinford, the political editor of The Times, who got a leak of the first shadow cabinet meeting. Exclusive, Kemi Badenoch used first meeting of shadow cabinet to criticise Rishi Sunak's election campaign amid concerns colleagues are failing to grasp enormity of defeat. It goes on to say, she said many Tories were clearly still traumatised. She said Suella Braverman, the former Home Secretary, appears to be having a very public nervous breakdown. Now, in reaction to that report, Suella Braverman responded, I'd be interested in knowing whether Kemi thinks I'm having a very public nervous breakdown. And you can see hashtag we don't leak at the bottom. Uh, she goes on to say, Kemi and the rest of the Cabinet should not have nodded along as they and Rishi took the party to disaster. The refusal to take responsibility is at the root of our problem. It was not someone else's fault. Um, what do you make of that, Spat? Uh, I think that the overwhelming uh, sense from the party and, and my backbench colleagues is that we need to focus more on what the public are saying to us and not what we say to each other. Um, and I, I'm disappointed that people are kind of continuing the, the, the psychodrama. Um, on the campaign trail, people frequently said to me, we just don't, you know, we don't want to see this arguing that goes on between you. And we need to get to a point, you have to have arguments in politics and sometimes very vociferous, strong arguments in politics, particularly if you've got a broad church party mm. like the Conservatives. But they have to happen behind closed doors and, and kind of iron out our issues and present a united plan and vision for the country. And that's, you know, that was definitely something that people felt that we'd failed to do and quite correctly. Does that rule both of them out, Kemi Badenoch and Suella Brotherman, for you as potential uh, leadership? The first thing I'd say about leaks is you do, it's not always, uh, you're not clear who actually leaks it. So you, you can't assume who it looks like leaked it has actually been the one that does it. There's kind of <laughs> counter warfare that sure, goes on. But, but, so, but my general rule would be I absolutely will not be supporting someone who is perpetuating the arguing and the lack of unity and, and having a go at each other. We can disagree with each other, but that doesn't mean we have to personally attack each other. So but you should be able to be robust in private. And, I, you know, who knows how that got out into the public domain? Well, yeah, who knows? If it's even um, true. It, well, uh, on the basis that we haven't had anything countering it, let's just leave it there. Um, what about who you might support? Who do you like the look of, Kieran? I think we absolutely have to put everybody through their paces and, and see what people are like when it comes to their, their, the deeper thinking they have about what we want to be as a party going forward, how they perform when it comes to hustings that we have or mm. perhaps in the media. I'm, I'm in no rush whatsoever to, to make a decision. So now. you would go long, as a, a number of your colleagues have yes, said? Yes, yes. What, to the end of the year? Oh, not that long, I don't think. Not that ah. long. But I think, yeah, I'm certainly not going to rush to make a judgment about who I might support early on. Have you got any ideas? I mean, is there anybody... No, really. No, really. I okay. genuinely want to see how everybody, what everyone puts forward as ideas. But you have set out quite clearly you'd rather those sorts of uh, spats and rows and personal mudslinging should be kept either out of it altogether or in private. But in terms of the state of the Conservative Party, they can't seem to organise even the simplest election contest. The Daily Telegraph, senior Tory confronts new 1922 chairman, and that is the chairman of the 1922 backbench committee of Conservative MPs in Bar over centrist leader plot. Mark Francois, a former armed forces minister, approaches Bob Blackman in Strangers Bar to claim process completely bent. Now, Bob Blackman is uh, the new chairman. Uh, Mark Francois, your colleague, did not like the way it was handled. He said it was rigged. Yeah, well, that's exactly an example of not doing it in private in the bar in Strangers. Again, if that is true, we have to deal with these issues in private because actually the public are not interested and they don't want to see yeah. headlines of what, how we're getting along or well, not getting well, along. Well, what does it say about your party? Well, what, you, had what's a bruising, wrong with the Conservative party? You know, we've had a bruising defeat and emotions run high. People feel very strongly about why it went wrong and what roles different people played. So it's inevitable that there's this kind of period of heightened tension, I think. Right. But, heightened tension, yes. I mean, that's putting it uh, mildly. But, I mean, there was even the election to the Conservative board. It's having to be rerun because they left someone's name off the ballot paper. Yeah. Now, of course, I know our viewers won't know the individuals involved, but it's a sort of symptomatic of what's happened to the Conservative. I don't think so. I, you know, I, I, I'm, the public probably don't have an appetite for, quite rightly, me going over the various things that I think we did deliver deliver well in government, and but there is plenty of it. And I, I, you know, I don't think that is a reflection of, of a wider government issue. 
thoughts, Claire? I, first of all, um, this is really like looking in on the personal grief of a party at war, and it's mm. unpleasant and I'm not interested. I thought that um, Jacob Rees-Mogg on Newsnight last night made a good point, which is time of silence might be required from the Conservatives and certainly one of humility. But I actually think something much bigger happened at this election than we're discussing, because I think that we're seeing the end of two-party politics in this country, the implosion of a mainstream party. I don't know if they can ever recover, and I'm not oh. saying that about this Tory party. I think if you look internationally, the, post, the, the parties, the main parties, are not fit for purpose. There is, I would like to remind you whether you like it or not, something of a populist upsurge in mm. lots of countries. But remember, Labour has just won. No, no, a... hugely, but as you indeed were discussing yesterday, yes. with a different kind of popular share of the vote. And that's not to take, because actually it was a tremendous win. But nonetheless, the voting got a chair, number of seats but that's too. what I'm saying, yeah. the Lib Dems broke through, the Greens did, Reform did, we have the well, rather worrying mm. Gaza candidates. But all I'm saying is something has changed in oh. British politics that I think is not just the same as, oh, well, all that needs to happen is you repair internally the damage in the Tory party and in five or ten years we'll be back to normal. There's been a lot of this, we'll go back. I actually think we're in a new era of politics mm -hmm. and that actually listening to the public is very important. A certain humility by the Labour Party will be required because despite the huge majority, which I hope they use well, well their popular vote was not well, enthusiastically... Put, well, it's not, just not Claire, it's not just Claire saying that, George. No, it's Barry, Gardner, Barry Gardner, uh, Labour MP, said it was a thin majority is how he put it. Do you agree? Um, yeah, did he? Yes, he did. He did. Uh, I, I mean, you know, Kieran's putting a brave face on well, it. Well, never mind but, about Kieran. Yeah. Let's focus well, on I the, the, you were the thin about majority. The Conservative Party, you know, and it's yes, but I'm moving on to the Labour government. But that's fine. You heard the day after the election, Keir Starmer stood outside Downing Street, and what he showed was humility. You know, humility was what we did after 2019. Our worst defeat in almost a century. What we did was come together, review why we lost, understand what had failed about us, not about voters, but about us, yeah. and then change the party. And we've just gone on to secure one of our biggest victories yeah. ever. But is, but it thin, is it a thin majority? Will, will, will continue. And absolutely, part of a government's job well. is to govern for the people who did not vote for that party. And, you know, I, I think to this broader point about populism all over the world, it is really important that governments act with a humility and a respect and a constant ongoing listening to the voters mm -hmm. who support well, them, or else actually the most important thing that we all around this table should care most about, mm -hmm. which is trust in politics, that is the most important thing that this Labour government has to change. Well, so how are you going to respond to this? It's only days into the new government. It's in the eye. Starmer facing immediate challenge from the left. So if we're talking about challenges on uh, all sides of the political spectrum, left and right, from the left on two child benefit cap. Now, this was going on through during the campaign, and it unites, actually, um, Nigel Farage, Suella Braverman, and many in the Labour Party. And we are hearing that, uh, well, she's tweeted it, I think, uh, Labour's uh, Liverpool Riverside MP, Kim Johnson, I've long campaigned against the two-child benefit cap, and I'm going to lay an amendment to the King's speech, which sets out your legislation, calling for the cap to be scrapped immediately. Do you agree with her? Well, it's first just worth saying about this issue that, 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 that child poverty is at the core of what the Labour Party... And this would exists. lift 250,000 children out of poverty. It would, of, it would of, indeed. ..of what the Labour Party exists to do. Right. However, what it meant to, to change our party from where we were in 2019 is to be a responsible party that cares about the state of the nation's finances <laughs> and does not commit to things that it doesn't know whether it can afford. And Rachel Reeves has been really clear, Keir Starmer has been really clear about this policy. We do not yet know if we can afford to, to support the removal of the two Would you like to account. remove it? So the responsible thing to do is say to the public, it breaks our hearts that we can't, but we can't. Mm. The public finances are in a dire state, breaks and so we heart. can't commit to doing this now. If and that, it, that is it, the kind of levelling with the well, public... I think it breaks our heart to see that we've want. got record levels of actual destitution in the country, and you've seen that as well from, you know, um, from the reports that have come out from um, the Roundtree Foundation. 
destitution and child poverty within that. It can't be just breaking our hearts. We have to do something about it in government. So as Liberal Democrats, we will be wanting to push you. We think with the Tory infighting going on at the moment, and Kieran, I do think most people don't want to hear it. And as you said, people don't want to see all of this. Go away, do it in private. While you're doing that, the Lib Dems now with 72 MPs, we will be the effective opposition <laughs> to Labour. And what we will be doing is pushing you, particularly on this issue. I don't necessarily think this is about Labour infighting. This is a key policy area, and we should be having cross-party debate about this. We will be pushing you because we think this is a key issue for relieving the levels of child poverty. Got to go beyond just words. Of course, and, and, and I agree with you, this is a really important policy question rather than, you know, the sort of personality psychodrama stuff. And, and what you've seen with the Labour government is we will have serious policy discussions, but we will also level with the public where we have to. We're not going to pretend that we can do everything and do everything fast when actually the nation's finances, our justice system, the water, you know, everything we've seen so far is in a shocking state of disrepair. And that is the inheritance that we have been left All right. by Conservatives who it, stopped governing. It, where are you on this? Honesty about the state of the country as Labour, New Labour, Labour government is describing, or is Pippa absolutely right? You can't just say words. You you should do this. No, thing. I, I actually like the levelling up with the public because okay. I can't stand the appealing to the public and trying to get their votes because you're frightened to you know that's. So I don't know. I don't. I like that approach on this particular issue. I think you're completely wrong, and you can't be. <laughs> you can't be in a situation where you don't concede. You've had to make choices. Mm. You've made choices all the way through. I think you've made some terrible choices. You know. That's your choice. That's fine. The gov you were voted for as a government. But you do have choice, right? You can't just say fiscal responsibility means we can't ever do this or that or that. You're making decisions which I think are absolutely barking that are going to, like I've just said, are going to mean energy prices go up for people, that we're going to be hopelessly and we would agree on this, but I think that fossil fuels are necessary, for example, in order for cheap energy for ordinary working people's bills to be kept down. So choices are made on principle, All right. as well as fiscal Could responsibility, say, and yeah, it this, just makes this, it to, sorry. there yeah. is no alternative. All right. this, is, this issue is exactly why, actually, you can't trust the Lib Dems to be in opposition, because it's broadly the same left-wing ideology. I'm glad to say that, actually, when it comes to the two-child policy, you have to make a choice. Do you expect people on benefits to make the same tough decisions about their family size that people who are not on benefits oh, make? Oh, but people, oh, that's, that's exactly people, people all the what, time... I'm sorry, but you're on the side people, of him. People all the time in, who, who, who aren't on benefits say, do you know what, I've got one child, maybe two children, I'd like to have a third child, I'd like to have a fourth child, but I can't afford to do that. And I don't think it's fair that those families are paying for the benefits of other people. Uh, can we do more to support well, people? Well, but that is can I just give you the figures? But let me just give you the figures. The, the Resolution the Foundation think tank says the cap means families cannot claim about £3,200 a year per extra uh, child. And that is a lot of money for families to lose out on. It would lift 250,000 children out of the I think one thing I took from, from the election campaign is speaking and to it people is is that we need to be, you know, that is, I'm afraid, what All right. in my experience most people think. That I'm, I, in my life, make decisions about my family size okay. because there are financial consequences to that. And why shouldn't everybody have to give some thought to that? All right. I mean it's the only answer, and people have benefits of one kind or another regardless, but we can at least yeah. have within the system recognition and there's some of those consensus. Well, there's some consensus. Well, there's some consensus there, isn't there? You agree? No, I... The, well, the hang on, you're not lifting the cap. No, you're no, 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 I completely do not agree. There's a completely different argument that Kieran's just made for me. Kieran says, I, on principle, think the two caps a good idea. I've said, I, in principle, would love to be able to change that policy in order right. to support those families. And I don't agree with Claire that in government, actually, you have to care about principle and that's what you decide. No, you care about principle and you also care about pragmatism and the All reality. Right. And you need to care about both of those things Let's, if you are going to govern responsibly. Let's uh, talk about working a four day week. Sounds good. Our guest Pippa, in addition to being a new MP, is also a councillor on South Cambridgeshire District Council. They've been running a trial of a four-day working week for desk-based and refuse workers in order to attract and retain staff. Um, this headline here in The Guardian, largest UK public sector trial of four-day week, sees huge benefits, uh, research finds. Tell us the experience of working a four-day week. Well, basically, first of all, let's just say it's a pilot. So local government is being told by the minister of the time as well and by the local government association to be innovative, especially when you're dealing with difficult situations. So in South Cambridgeshire, which has some of the highest prices for homes um, and people being pushed further and further out, a lot of staff are having to travel more than an hour to get into work, which means we've had some of the key positions within the um, council 
really impossible to fill. So taxpayers have been paying agency rates for their services. What this has done now with the trial, and it's still a trial which is ongoing, but the early results show, one, that residents have not had any change in terms of the quality of the services that they receive. Two, which is the most important thing really, but two, we have been able to make savings. So we've had savings of up to already £400,000 of those agency staff, and we now have got all of our hard to fill permanent positions filled. Why does that make it important? Key planning decisions, they are now being made faster than they ever were before. Some of the big development of planning applications, but right. also it means if you're somebody who's got homelessness issues, planning mm. issues, it well, matters that you've got somebody who knows your area, not somebody who's an agency staff sure. coming but in. But the broadly, that you've seen the benefits we'll and the experience the has been benefits. positive. I mean, the model, just to be clear, is that council officials deliver 100% of their work in around 80% of the hours for 100% of their pay. What's not to like? I think the difficulty with anything that's through the pilot is, you, you know, pilots typically are done by the enthusiastic and they're done in a very kind of uh, energetic way. And you have to think about what actually happens if we roll this out across the country without people who are quite so enthusiastic. And I think when I speak to voters, they're concerned that they don't necessarily in all circumstances end up with value for money when it comes for, you know, how to let people work less. And in terms of the benefits that you've seen, yeah, I'm a doctor in my background, so in terms of scientific studies, most of these studies wouldn't hold up to a proper scientific scrutiny in terms of I'd saying that this is exactly why you've got those improvements. Multiple things happen in local government at the same time. How can you really be sure it's just because of that change well, in working What's very, hours? very interesting is that, um, strangely, you know, so what we had was central government looking at a tiny district council and telling them that they wanted to see daily evidence way beyond the trial. So, in fact, the, the, the council has had to provide copious amounts of data for six months for the government to look yes. at it and the government said after six yeah. months actually we haven't really found anything yeah. we're going to extend but it for another itself, six months in itself, I mean, you know, when what you're madness every, that's not no, good no, no. use of taxpayer no, no. money in but my view that's you know? a really good example so of course when you're being asked every single day <laughs> to report on exactly what you're doing with these expanded hours that in itself changes people's behavior and isn't reflective just of what shows what centralist government this is more, you know empower local government to just get on and do their job. This is the principle. Mm. Well, Let them get jo on with their own. Well, uh, Josh Labour is in power now. Are you sympathetic? Four day week. I think if there's good evidence for something like well, this, there, then well, there it's is. up to, to, well, yeah, this is one study. You know, in order to, to really roll something like this out, you have to look at it lots and lots and lots of times. But, you know, this was a council and it's up for councils and businesses to decide whether to adopt this kind of thing, not up to a government to tell them whether or not they should. Well, I think I do have a worry about it. The Conservative government tried to, I think. I do have a worry about it, though, which I think is important, which is um, if you've got a nice fancy house and you make lots of money and you're a consultant mm. or whatever, then working a four day week is one thing. But actually, my constituents are often not in jobs like that. Mm. And for them to be told, actually, a four day working week will help you produce more and yes. And in the meantime, you'll have a great mm. time. I think there's some skepticism about that. And I think there is a risk that what it does is further entrench, yeah. you know, the consultants, the lawyers, the professionals mm. and the service sector, the McDonald's worker who's serving them a burger mm. on a Friday. Yeah. And we must not well, do that. Claire? I think it's very important that we recognise the cultural problems we've had in relation to working from home that came out of lockdown, a situation in which, I mean, the idea that local councils, the service uh, delivery didn't go down, well, it's not very high, it's a low bar, I don't mean for your council, I mean in general. And as somebody who's been trying to get through to my council as a council leaseholder, you know, you know, first of all, they say we're working from home still because of COVID. You think change the answer phone message at the very least, but you can't get anyone. The idea that there's one less day. So I think you've got to be very careful that we don't in incorporate this notion that going to work is terrible. Because I think culturally for a lot of young people, what we've said is, is that earning your living, working hard, working 120% in the 100% time that you've got. I mean, if you can work hard in four days, then you can work hard in but five actually, days. Pro productivity has gone up. So this is the point. So but, we've had but, fewer on the refuse collectors. So first of all, it was the desk-based jobs. But obviously you've got the people who pick up mm. the waste and do that and driving the vans. Yeah. What it's shown is that we've got higher productivity, less sick oh. days, of the people okay. also working. Well, can I just you. pick up, because we've only yeah. got a few seconds yeah. left, and I know you've all been watching the Euros. Of course you have. The Lib Dems are suggesting a day off, a bank holiday, if England wins on Sunday. Yes or no? No, no bank holiday. Kieran? No, I don't think so. Oh. <laughs> well, I'll Presumably yes. you're <laughs> saying yes. Uh, Claire, what do you think? I think it'll be a bit like the four-day week where people will take it, whether it's official <laughs> exactly. or not. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a that's very honest answer. A politician <laughs> answer, isn't it? <laughs>
True answer. Yeah. <laughs> That's all we have time for but today. I will be, yeah, of yes, course, yes. 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 yes, I'll be back on Monday with more Politics Live, and I will be back, whatever the result on Sunday, I think, at 12.15 here on BBC Two and the iPlayer. Bye-bye.